Hey guys, Luke here. Cool announcement. I have recorded the audiobook for Deep in the Woods. My book on mental health, depression, anxiety released a year ago was met with a great response, but over and over, I wrote it for young people, and over and over I was met with the question, will you do an audiobook? Do you have an audiobook? So I did. I recorded the audiobook three times for Audible for Amazon. I love books that are read by the author, so I recorded it myself three times. It was rejected from Amazon. I messed with the settings. Listen, I'm not an audio engineer, but I know enough to get by, and it just wasn't cutting it. So I said, you know what? I'm gonna release it on YouTube. I kind of threw my hands up in the air. I just want young people to have access to this resource. So I'm releasing the video now on YouTube. I've, I've rented out a cool space to film in, and I am reading the entire book for you for free, fully on YouTube. Take a listen. I hope this blesses you. I'm just a crazy baker, and this book is my attempt to help young people. Let me explain. Charles John Joan was born in Birkenhead, England on August 3rd, 1879. Previously chief baker on Titanic's sister ship, Olympic, he was hired onto the Titanic as the chief baker in preparation for the ship's historic maiden voyage. He led a staff of 13, 10 bakers, two confectioners, and a Vienna baker. His monthly wage made him one of the highest paid crew members on board. At the investigation of the Titanic sinking, Charles testified that he was off duty in his bunk when the famous iceberg collision happened on that cold April night in 1912. He sent his bakers up with more than 50 loaves of bread to load onto the lifeboats for the passengers. Then he returned to his room for a drink. What must have been racing through his mind in that moment? After he drank, he then went up to the boat deck to board his assigned lifeboat on the port side of the ship. He helped put women and children in the boat, but did not get in himself. After the lifeboat, lifeboat launched safely, Joan went back to his room for more liquor before returning to the boat deck. By the time he emerged, all the lifeboats were gone. He then went down to B deck and started throwing deck chairs overboard to be used as flotation devices for survivors already in the water. As the Titanic started tilting heavily, he made his way to the starboard side of the poop deck and onto the outside of the rails of the ship to climb down in the water. When he was lowered into the water, Joan claimed he simply swam away, and as dawn broke over the horizon, he made his way to collapsible lifeboat B. He was the last person off the ship. Joan wasn't the safety officer on the Titanic. He wasn't the captain. He didn't hold any high-ranking operational title. He was just a baker. In that crisis, in the sinking of a ship that the world had deemed unsinkable, none of that mattered. What mattered was that Joan had the heart to save people. How many were saved that day because of Baker drank some liquid courage, stayed behind, and threw a bunch of chairs over the deck. In the areas of mental health, anxiety, and depression, we have a sinking ship. We are in a state of emergency. On October 19th, 2021, the American Academy of Pediatrics declared a national emergency. A group of more than 67,000 pediatricians rallied together and wrote the following declaration about the mental state of young people in our nation. I'm going to read a piece of it here, and then I'll link the rest in the description of this video. Declaration of National Emergency in Child and Adolescent Mental Health. As health professionals dedicated to the care of children and adolescents, we have witnessed soaring rates of mental health challenges among children, adolescents, and their families throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, exacerbating the situation that existed before the pandemic. Children and families across the country have experienced enormous adversity and disruption. The iniquities that result from structural racism have contributed to disproportionate impacts on children from communities of color. The worsening crisis in child and adolescent mental health is inextricably tied to the stress brought on by COVID-19 and the ongoing struggle for racial justice that represents an acceleration of trends observed before 2020. Rates of childhood mental health concerns and suicide rose steadily between 2010 and 2020. And by 2018, suicide was the second leading cause of death for young people ages 10 
to 24. The pandemic has intensified this crisis. Across the country, we have witnessed dramatic increases in emergency department visits for all mental health emergencies, including suspected suicide attempts. They then list a response of things that they deem as appropriate actions to take. And these organizations got a lot of things right in this declaration. Notably, the overall commitment to discover and deploy practical tools. As they said, we must identify strategies to meet these challenges through innovation and action using state, local, and national approaches to improve the access and the quality of care across the continuum of mental health promotion, prevention, and treatment. They aren't addressing the local church's response, though. Not that they should. Historically, the church's response to mental health has been less than stellar. While things have gotten better in the past five years, for the most part, the church has told young people to pray more, read your Bible more, trust God more, join a small group, lay it down at the cross, wait it out. It's probably just a phase or your hormones are out of balance. Too often, the church has responded to serious issues of the heart with cliche Christianese terms, especially when dealing with depression in young people. Maybe we're lazy or we genuinely believe those answers are an appropriate response to dealing with the pain of depression. They're not. It's high time we, the church, stop sweeping this issue under the rug or attempting to fix it with cheap band-aids. I've come to this conclusion after first-hand experience. My wife and I became youth pastors at a great church in Abilene, Texas in January of 2018. We had moved from about three hours away in North Fort Worth, but we quickly fell in love with the town and the young people in our church. The more we got involved and got to know the students, the more we began to see a common issue floating beneath the surface of their lives, the darkness of depression and anxiety. During one of our first youth services, I took a chunk of time to listen. Rather than guess what I feel you need to hear this year, why don't you tell me what to preach? I set the microphone down and I picked up a blank notebook and a pen. Go ahead, I'm listening. Tell me what you're struggling with. All kinds of struggles, theological questions, and teenage issues began to unravel from the crowd of 50 or so kids in the room that night. We had a list of around 30 different topics by the end of the segment, but a stark theme emerged. As I reviewed the topics later that night, nearly half involved emotions like anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. As my wife and I continued in that ministry in the coming months, we noticed this wasn't a one-time reference list to give us good teaching content. This was a real issue that needed to be dealt with. In every small group time, every altar time, and nearly every side conversation we had with students, the darkness of anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts rose to the surface like thick scum on a swamp. Our hearts were broken as we tried to navigate how to address this. We've all dealt with it on some level, but we certainly didn't feel qualified to tackle it head on. After all, we weren't licensed counselors. We started looking for help, resources, sermons, Bible study outlines, teaching curriculum, anything we could that would help us deal with this issue for teenagers. And we couldn't find much. What we did find seemed very surface level. Some even responded with the empty platitudes I listed earlier. We leaned into God. It felt so much heavier than creating a fun and dynamic sermon series for teenagers. We needed to see strongholds broken and people walking from darkness to light. We prayed and studied, and after a few weeks, we felt we had something God could use. It, it still felt pitiful, but we felt that God could breathe on it and make it something powerful. As I wrapped up studying for the first night in our series, I admitted to my wife that it wouldn't be much unless God moved on it. Then I was reminded of another crazy baker. In 1 Kings 17, we read about the widow who was starving to death until Elijah came along. All she had was a tiny bit of flour and oil left. She made a cake with what she had, and the Lord multiplied her resources. In the same way, in the spring of 2018, we offered what we had come up with out of our hearts and told God it was his to use. He did. Powerful ministry took place through that three-week series, and we saw many heart issues begin to be dealt with. It wasn't a magic wand that fixed everyone's problems and immediately infused the young people with endless happiness, but for many, it started a process of healing and restored joy. Our altar times were powerful, but on top of that, it gave our students permission to talk about the dark places in their heart that too many had dismissed as teenage angst. We felt that a few of the principles we uncovered could be helpful to others, both for young people as they fight depression for themselves, as well as youth workers and parents who fight it for others. We ended up teaching this series, or a version of it, once every year for three years. We fine-tuned the material, studied more, and revised some concepts as they aged. Not one book, sermon, or resource is enough to answer the pain and heal the crisis that we're in. Instead, we need more layers added to the Christian conversation. This book is a response to this mental health crisis, but it is not the end-all, be-all solution. It's another perspective to the conversation, another layer in the mental health parfait that the church is building right now. During my time on staff at our church, I dealt with a bout of anxiety and depression in a way I never had before. I brushed it off. It was an unusual, weird feeling. 
I was sleeping less. I had a lot more anger and fear that I had dealt with before. It was January of 2020, right before the pandemic. I brushed it off because after all, I was a pastor. I've never dealt with anxiety. I was a champion for Jesus and my mind was strong. At least that's what I kept telling myself. There was a lot to unpack and deal with in my heart that I was unaware of. And I'll dive into this in a later chapter. As I said, my wife and I are not counselors and we're certainly not qualified to speak on a clinical level. We're really bakers who had a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil and we made a cake. We hope this helps you. Chapter one, In the Woods. Get ready, I'll probably ruin one of your favorite childhood books. I have a purpose though, so stay with me. I wanna explore a theory regarding mental health, depression, and anxiety. The world evaluates mental health under a particular set of criteria. Often as Christians, we over-spiritualize things and we neglect the spiritual realm, the natural realm. We can have our heads so high in the clouds that we ignore the real, diagnosable, and medically treatable disorders. On the flip side, people can be so focused on earthly solutions and medicating the symptoms that they don't ever recognize that a spiritual issue may be at the root. While we can't exaggerate the spiritual issues, we also can't minimize them either. As David wrote in Psalm 34, 4, I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Is it possible we can medicate something that can be solved by seeking the Lord's deliverance? It's easy to be caught up in both sides of that argument. However, sometimes the answer can be both. I live in Texas and I have several favorite barbecue joints locally that I get way too that get way too much of my money. My roommate in Bible school, who was from South Carolina, swore up and down that the barbecue was better in his hometown than in Texas. Having tried that barbecue style, I prefer Texas's version. But why choose? Why not both? Can't we enjoy multiple types of cooked meat without making it a competition? Who says one is right and one is wrong or one is better and the other is worse? Who said medicine is terrible and trusting God is the only right way? Who said we have to pick one of those options? all the time. Let's begin by diving into some diagnostics that medical researchers and clinical psychologists have discovered. We won't spend much of this book diving into this, but it is worth discussing and bringing up before we examine God's response to mental health. First, you're not alone. If you're struggling with mental health, then know you are seen and known. A report published in 2000 by the Canadian Medical Association called Pathology in the 100 Acre Wood, a neurodevelopmental perspective on A.A. Milne. In short, they picked apart the world of Winnie the Pooh and zoomed in on each character through the lens of mental health disorders. On the surface, it's an innocent world. Christopher Robin living in a beautiful forest surrounded by his loyal animal friends. Generations of readers of A.A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh stories have enjoyed these seemingly benign tales. However, perspective changed with time and it's clear to modern neurodevelopmentalists that these are stories of seriously troubled individuals, many of whom meet diagnostic and statistical manual DSM, Criteria for Mental Disorders. Let's recap the works of A.A. Milne and offer the researchers' conclusions about the inhabitants of the Hundred Acre Wood. According to their work, Winnie the Pooh stories are not random stories about animals, but they contain specific patterns. Each of the Winnie the Pooh characters represent a mental illness. First of all, Christopher Robin with schizophrenia. Christopher Robin is the only human in the Hundred Acre Woods. His friends are imaginary stuffed animals who had come to life. His imagination takes him into a different world where reality is altered and he's unsure of what is real and what is not. Winnie the Pooh, impulsivity with obsessive fixations, ADHD and OCD. Winnie the Pooh has an eating disorder. His obsession with honey is legendary and he would do anything to get his hands on another jar. He's adventurous, but has difficulty focusing on his goals. His mind is messy, he never makes schedules and his life often takes a hit. Piglet with general, Generalized Anxiety Disorder, or GAD. Piglet, Piglet suffers from generalized anxiety disorders and low self-esteem, possibly due to some trauma in his past. He's nervous and is stressed and stressed and has a speech impediment, which may add to his anxiety. He has a kind heart. He often experiences excessive anxiety, which makes him unable to perform tasks. He hides in fear when faced with a sudden noise or movement. He needs a quiet and relaxing environment. Tigger. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, ADHD. Tigger is incapable of controlling his hyperactivity. He rapidly switches moods and shows signs that he may have a readiness to try any substance that come his way, making him at risk for a substance abuse problem. On the surface, Tigger is a lot of fun, but those who associate with him risk getting into trouble. He's excitable and never quiet. He's always looking forward to what he can do next, what adventures await him, and how he can be entertained. Kanga, Social Anxiety Disorder. Kanga is a mother kangaroo who always carries her child, Roo, in her pocket. Kanga is a helicopter parent. She worries about her family, so she lives in a state of unease. She is constantly overwhelmed and stressed. Rabbit, anger and obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. Rabbit is highly organized to the point of obsession. 
Everything must be in its place. Rabbit is the neatest Winnie the Pooh character. He likes his things to be organized and gets annoyed when someone disrupts his world. Eeyore, depressive disorder. This one is more obvious than the other character disorders. He has a negative outlook on life and an inability to enjoy anything. His depression may even be characterized as acute. Eeyore is rarely happy, so no, ma no matter what good things happen around him. Let's dig below the surface. Do one or more of these character diagnoses resonate with you? Can you understand their symptoms and struggles on a personal level? Perhaps you recognize some of them in those around you. When I began writing a book on mental health, I knew it was a broad topic to cover. That's why I bring Winnie the Pooh study into this book. I wanted to give you a sense of the diversity of issues that could be affecting you. It's impossible to do justice to every mental health issue in one book, and I'm certainly not qualified to discuss every aspect of these mental health battles. Just as the researchers dove beneath the surface of what lay in the 100 acre wood, I would encourage you to find help from a professional who can diagnose, diagnose the more profound issues that you may face. As we dive into the following chapters, Eeyore, depression, is the area that we will cover. I'll take a biblical spiritual approach to how we can deal with and work through depression, but this book is not a comprehensive resource on the subject. If you're struggling, get help. Don't let your depression go untreated. Here are a few places to find help. Number one, meet with a pastor in your area. They may not be the answer to your problems, but a good leader knows other resources to tap into and can help get you qualified help. Number two, search your local area for a licensed professional counselor, LPC. Look for the word sliding scale if budget is an issue or, insurance, or your insurance doesn't cover mental health care. Money shouldn't be an obstacle to getting the help you need. Number three, consider an online video therapist. Several of my friends use BetterHelp, I'm not a sponsor, and it's an excellent tool for virtual therapy if your local area doesn't have a lot of options. Finally, if you're in an immediate low spot and need to talk to someone now, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The Lifeline provides 24 seven free and confidential support, prevention and crisis resources for people in distress, and best practices for professionals in the United States. Call 988. I can't stress this enough, get help if you need it. Don't let depression lead you into a mental health crisis or suicidal thoughts. There is a way out of the woods. Chapter two, it's real. I'm sorry. I'm sorry your feelings haven't been validated. I'm sorry you don't have anyone who understands what you're going through and that church leaders have dismissed, ignored, or discounted your issues as not being real. I'm sorry people have given you crappy advice. Just pray about it. Read your Bible. Although well-meaning, comments like those are often a cop-out for adults who don't know how to deal with your issues. Depression is a real and very tangible thing. It's a darkness and a deeply painful emotion. Dealing with it begins admitting that it's legitimate. It doesn't hold power over the light of the world, Jesus, but to dismiss it is a disservice to you and what you're going through. You can fight this though. There may not be a quick fix, but I wanna give you hope that there's light at the end of the tunnel. Throughout this book, you're going to receive practical tools that will help you claw and fight your way out of it. In the end, that's better than a magic wand. When you've fought and clawed your way out of darkness to victory, you can then crawl back and help other people out later. Mental health disorders like anxiety, emotional disorders, depression, excessive anxiety, and mood disorder are increasing, affecting people worldwide. The younger generation especially are experiencing more psychological pressure that comes as a result of too much access to smartphones and not having adequate sleep. The bad news is that it's on the rise. The good news is more people are willing to talk about it and deal with it. A healthy mental state is a big deal. It enables you to use your full potential, build good relationships with other people, and enjoy life. Meanwhile, a mental breakdown could put you in a bad mood. Everything's thrown off. In addition, you may experience weakness in your thinking, have difficulty controlling your emotions, and make poor decisions. What is depression? If you place a heavy iron or a weight in the heart-shaped foam of a pillow, that plump pillow becomes pressed down or depressed. If you remove the iron the next day, the pillow returns to its original form. If you wait six months to remove the iron though, the pillow will not return to its original shape. Instead, that pillow will remain flat and depressed. A pillow, which can sustain temporary pressure, is not designed to hold its shape for a long time under pressure. The same is true of the human heart. When pressed down due to normal pressure from everyday situations, situational depression, your heart is designed by God to rebound once the pressure is removed. However, if you live under the weight of heavy pressure for long periods, your heart can enter a state of depression. Realize that Jesus cares about your heart and knows you are especially vulnerable when you are heavy hearted. That's why, he give this word, that's why he gives this word of caution. Be careful or your hearts will be weighted down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. And that day will close in on you suddenly like a trap. Luke 21, 34. 
Depression literally means to be pressed down to a lower position, as in a footprint. Depression can refer to a state of decline or reduced activity, as in economic depression. And depression is sometimes a result of an emotional heaviness that weighs the heart down. The Apostle Paul used the Greek word bereo, which means pressed or weighed down, to describe the immense emotional pressure and severe hardships that he and Timothy suffered at the hands of those who opposed Christ. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. 2 Corinthians 1, 8-9 Believers are not immune to depression. Even David dealt with it. Sadly, the stigma surrounding depression often makes us have to deal with it on our own. Isolated, we carry our burden not knowing how to get help. As people disconnect in a greater degree from the real world and as family values deteriorate at an alarming rate and sin becomes more ingrained in our world, we cannot expect this statistic to improve. This stuff doesn't even address the effects of COVID-19 and social distancing. June Hunt, author of Biblical Counseling Keys, writes about four different categories of depression. Although independent from one another, these four categories show how an escalating intensity of depression in general, depression could be divided into two categories. Situational depression occurs when a painful situation presses the heart down for a period of time. Chemical depression can occur when the body's chemistry does not function properly. A person can have either type of depression or both at the same time. During these heavy-hearted times, hope seems elusive, emotions feel flat, and the heart feels sick. Solomon, the wise author of the book of Proverbs, explains that hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. The four types of depression described next are not listed in this exact order in a diagnostic manual. The terms are used here with intent to show the increasing negative impact of unresolved depression. Number one, normal depression, sometimes called situational depression or reactive depression. It's an involuntary sadness based on reaction to painful life situations. Normal problems of life like rejection, failure, or illness press the heart down for a short period of time. Transitional stages of life like adolescence, empty nesting, midlife crisis, major moves, menopause, or retirement often fall in this category. When severe troubles fell upon God's servant Job, like the death of all his children and the destruction of all his possessions, one of his friends observed Job's understandable depression. Now trouble comes to you and you're discouraged. It strikes you and you're dismayed. Job 4, 5. Number two is masked depression. Hidden depression stemming from suppressed memories of physical, sexual, verbal, or emotional abuse is a state of enduring sadness based on unresolved or buried conflict. Masked depression results when painful feelings are denied or covered up. Recovery takes longer because of a failure to work through the pain. Relief from emotional pain is unconsciously found in excessive busyness, activities, addictions, or other alternatives. The Bible describes how hidden hurts result in heartache. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. Proverbs 14 13. Number three is neurotic depression, a minor mental and emotional depressive disorder. A prolonged state of sadness lasting longer than the normal time frame expected for emotional recovery and based on stressors like the loss of an endeared friendship, a financial or work crisis, or retirement. A person with a neurotic depression has a disorder, so normal activities of daily living are impaired. It falls under the category of clinical depression and requires diagnosis and treatment based on direct, ongoing observation. The cause can usually be traced to an identifiable, precipitating event. The Psalms reflect the pain of prolonged sorrow. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Psalm 13, 2. Number four is psychotic depression, the most severe type of depression under the classification major depressive disorder, based on a disassociation or loss of contact with reality. The psychotic depression is an extreme state of depression that is sometimes accompanied by hallucinations or delusions. Those suffering from this are potential danger to themselves or others. Those afflicted with a psychotic depression can identify with the terror, despair, and skewed perspective described in this psalm. My days vanish like smoke. My heart is blighted and withered like grass. I forget to eat my food. I lie awake. I have become like a bird alone on a roof. I eat ashes as my food and mingle my drink with tears. I wither away like grass. Psalm 102, 3 through 4, 7, 9, and 11. Many times, believers experiencing depression frequently burden themselves with guilt, feeling that they should be more joyful and ashamed of the emptiness they feel in their quiet time. Often, this is fueled by the idealistic, unrealistic, and well-intentioned teaching that believers should experience uninterrupted joy in this broken world. The teaching isn't biblical. 
Although this may be well-intentioned, it sets us up for failure in our walk with God. It makes us believe there must be something wrong with my faith if I'm depressed. Yet even Paul acknowledged that there were times when we were overwhelmed beyond our power so that we even lost hope of preserving life in 2 Corinthians 1.8. This expression, we lost hope, indicates a loss of mental and emotional composure. I don't know about you, but I'm comforted knowing that even the great Apostle Paul was taken to such extremes due to life circumstances. It's also important to point out that depression is not picky about who it affects. It can impact strong and weak believers, new believers, and those who have been following the Lord's ways for decades. It afflicts the married and the single, widows and young mothers, devout believers with pure hearts and great potential, and those who struggle frequently are inconsistent in their faith. Depression touches many Christians in different ways and under all kinds of circumstances. Ultimately, no matter the manifestation or severity, the problem must be presented to God, just as David did in Psalm 6. He expressed how he felt and how he flooded his bed with tears every night. Still, in the end, he said that God heard his prayer and would save him. Even when we don't feel him or his nearness, it is necessary to be sincere with God. He hears the prayers of his children. We can approach God as a friend and have confidence that in him there is refuge and peace. I've told you this so you may have peace. In this world you will face afflictions, but take heart because I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. The world groans under the heavy burden of sin, and so do our hearts. As we seek recovery, our deepest needs can only be met by Christ. Spouses, friends, and parents may not understand what we're going through, but God sees and he cares. God told Joshua to be courageous and strong. Then he told him an extraordinary truth. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Yes, anywhere. We don't have to feel alone. God is with us. He's working on our problem even when we don't notice. It's time to fight back God's way. Let's begin. Chapter 3, An Attack on Your Strength In the Bible, Nehemiah was a part of Israel's rebuilding of the wall around the nation. It's a beautiful story worth studying in depth, but here I'm only going to dive into a few highlights. The people of Israel were well underway with the building when their enemies realized they were more vulnerable than ever, and they began to plan attacks. Nehemiah realized what was happening before it was too late and came up with a plan. So we built the wall, and all the wall were joined together by ha to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the repairing of the wall of Jerusalem was going forward and that the breaches were beginning to be closed, they were very angry. And they all planned together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. And we prayed to our God and set guards as a protection against them day and night. In Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves we will not be able to rebuild the wall. And our enemies said, they will not know or see until we come among them and kill them and stop the work. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed people by their clans with their swords, their spears, and their bows. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Nehemiah 4, 6 through 11, 13, and 14. Eventually, Israel finished the wall among the struggles and battles. One spoiler alert is at the completion, Nehemiah climbed a small wooden platform and addressed the nation. It was a sad time of reading laws and addressing a new standard for the nation. It made sense. After all, if they had just rebuilt a wall, wouldn't it make sense for someone to address the failed laws that led to the wall's first crumbling? After Nehemiah read, finished reading the laws, people were sad and worn out, so he encouraged them to make Israel great again. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. And then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to the Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8, 9, and 10. Life is a battle. It often feels like we're fighting the world on one hand while trying to build the rest of our lives with the other. So many options and decisions lie ahead of us, and brick by brick, we're building what our destiny will look like while simultaneously fighting off the sins, emotions, and enemies of the present. The Word encourages us that we have an asset, a strength, the joy of the Lord. That's why it may feel like there's an all-out attack on your joy. That's why the depression is so thick, so drowning. The enemy of your soul is trying to steal your joy so you won't have any strength. If I were the devil, fighting for control over your eternity, your soul, I would start by attacking the one thing that can give you strength. If I can attack your strength, I'll weaken your long game and eventually win the fight. Depression is a great tool that he uses in the battle for your soul. It's time to fight back. You do not have to lie down and take this beating of your mind and emotions. You have permission to stand up and hit the devil back, to punch your depression in the teeth with the truth of God's word. 
It may help to realize that you're not alone in your depression. Of course, millions of people struggling across the globe with some level of depression, but let's even explore some legends, icons of the faith who dealt with this. Moses. Moses was the depressed leader of the people of Israel. Every time he turned around, they griped about something. We're starving. We need water. We need food, but we hate manna. If you were surrounded by a bunch of people you were trying to help, people who did nothing but complain, it would be hard not to be depressed. And just one day, Job lost everything he had, his possessions, his family, and his health. His entire body was covered with festering boils. He only had a wife and friends left. Unfortunately, the people closest to him were unwilling to be close to him again. He ended up cursing the day he was born. Why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? I have no peace, no quietness, I have no rest, but only turmoil. Job chapter 3. He felt abandoned, but he still had hope in God. His faith never wavered. Although in several passages we read that he expressed all his sighs to God. In the end, he chose to surrender. From Job, we learn not all the advice we receive from others is the best for us. We must always weigh it against the Bible. Second, we also learn to love and praise God regardless of our condition. It's easy for us to praise God when we're doing well, but when things go badly, we can curse God instead. From Job, we also learn not to depend on circumstances. Instead, we choose to believe in God's plan. David was one of the significant biblical figures who, dis who experienced considerable depression. He went through a lot of difficult times in his life. He fled for his life from King Saul. Throughout the Psalms, we read of Damon's, David's groaning and desperation. In Psalm 62, he used words such as overwhelmed, heavy burden, bowed down, distracted, troubled, and death. His words describe how dire the situation looked. David still remembered God as a source of hope. From David, we learn how to remind ourselves of God's promises when we're in a state of depression. Even though our feelings tell us that things won't get better, we can remember how God has never let us down in the past. The Apostle Paul experienced depression. In 2 Corinthians 12, Paul wrote that he had a thorn in the flesh, possibly to keep him humble. Obviously, Paul didn't like that thorn. No one likes thorns, whether they are sticking physically to their side or in their spirit. Paul said it was a messenger of Satan to torment him. Ruth is another person who experienced depression or despair. Ruth's hard times began with her husband's death in Ruth 1.5. As a result, she struggled financially. She learned that her mother-in-law had decided to leave Moab and return to her homeland. Ruth left the land of her birth with her mother-in-law, but without a husband. Imagine how heavy her burden was. Ruth was in dire straits. She could do nothing but cry and wail in a foreign land without a husband. Eventually, she decided to serve her mother-in-law. God was there and blessed her. She even met her second husband, and they lived happily. Ruth didn't immediately see that God would provide for her. She didn't know that he had good things in store for her. Her only path was to keep going despite the difficult season. Ultimately, it comes down to this. The basis of the Christian life is truth not feelings. Philippians 4.1 commands us to rejoice whether we like the situation we're in or not. James 1.2 says, consider it happiness if you fall into various trials. Notice that James is not telling us to rejoice, but he's telling us to count, choosing to think of our situations as difficulties where we can experience joy. Depression has been around forever. As long as Satan is at work in this world trying to pull you away from God and de-emphasizing the image of God in you, you will fight depressive thoughts. I remember back to the time when my middle child, Kayla, was about two years old. It was a fun stage where he started running all over the place talking and his personality began to emerge. We called this the getting into everything stage. He loved to take stuff apart. He would be constantly pulling toys apart, the battery covers off the of remotes, getting into ingredients in the pantry. He had the drive to find out what's at the center of everything and take it down to that level. Interestingly enough, Satan's strategy is a lot like most toddlers. He wants to get to the center, to the most vulnerable. He knows the quickest way to destroy us is to attack our hearts and emotions. By going for the center, he can cripple us. In the Bible, the Greek word for heart, cardia, does not refer to the physical beating organ, but is always used figuratively in scripture to refer to the seat and center of human life. The heart is the center of the personality. It controls the intellect, the emotions, and the will. It's the control center of our will or being. Picture air traffic controllers who monitor and regulate all the incoming and outbound traffic at the airport. It's the same with the cardia, the heart. Everything works well when the heart is working well and lined up correctly. Proverbs 4.23 tells us, So above all, guard the affections of your heart, for they affect all that you are. Pay attention to the welfare of your innermost being, for from there flows the wellspring of life. We must pay attention to the welfare of our innermost being. If the Lord urges us to tend well to our heart, our core, how much more would Satan want to attack that? Have you seen the Pixar movie Inside Out? 
Five different emotions are portrayed as characters inside the mind of an 11-year-old girl, Riley. They receive access to a control panel that dictates how she will live her life and how she will remember specific moments of her life, all depending on which emotion is in control. I love that movie, and I love the picture that it paints of what is going on in our heads and our hearts. Our surroundings, memories, and experiences create emotions that shape who we are and drive our lives. The enemy wants to drive. He wants control. If he can't destroy you with outside circumstances, he'll do his very best to take you down from within. He wants to have his hands on the control board in your mind. He's trying to make you spiral. Next, we'll cover some specific tools Satan uses to try to regain control. Here's the good news. If you know his strategy, you can learn how to fight back. The Marvel superhero movies are incredible. This feels like the golden age of comics. One of superhero movies. Where was this when I was a 10 year old kid? At the time of this book writing, the current concept within the Marvel Cinematic Universe is the idea of the multiverse. It's an idea that worlds exist parallel to each other and occasionally intersect when portals that connect the two worlds open. More and more, I'm beginning to see how life mirrors that. We live in a physical or earthly realm while simultaneously being part of a spiritual or heavenly realm. Ephesians 6.12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Behind every physical disturbance, setback, ailment, or issue we face, there is a spiritual root. Unless we first identify and deal with the spiritual root, our attempts to fix the physical problem will only provide temporary relief. In light of this, you and I need to engage a sixth sense. A spiritual sense when battling in this war for mental health. We must employ that which goes beyond physiology and address the spiritual root before we can fix the physical fruit. Here's the key to experiencing and living in the victory God has already secured in heaven. Learn to battle intentional, intentionally and effectively in the spiritual realm. Satan often tries to prevent us from taking the spiritual realm seriously. If he can divert our attention away from the spiritual realm, he can keep us away from the only place where our victory is found. If he can distract us with people or things that we can see, taste, touch, hear, or smell, he can keep us from living a life of victory. In 1 Kings 19 and 20, Satan attacked the prophet Elijah with depression, but Elijah defeated that attack. In 1 Kings 19, 1-4, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he went on a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. What makes this so remarkable is that it comes immediately after Elijah had defeated all the Baal worshippers on Mount Carmel, when God set fire to the altar that he saturated with water. Right after seeing that powerful display of God, Elijah found himself hiding under a tree wishing to be dead. He was physically and emotionally exhausted and his life was threatened. He was experiencing fear, resentment, anger, loneliness, and worry. He wanted to die. The Bible says in James 5.17 that Elijah was a man just like us. He was a prisoner in the prison cell of depression, a place we've all been. But God always gives a way out. This is illustrated by a short poem entitled Autobiography in Five, four ch five Short Chapters by Portia Nelson. Chapter one, I walk down the street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I fall in. I'm lost. I'm helpless. It isn't my fault. It takes forever to find a way out. Chapter two, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I pretend I don't see it. I fall in again. I can't believe I'm in the same place, but it isn't my fault. It takes a long time to get out. Chapter three, I walk down the same street. There's a deep hole in the sidewalk. I see it's there. I still fall in. It's a habit. My eyes are open. I know where I am. It is my fault. I get out immediately. Chapter four, I walk down the same street. There's a hole in the sidewalk. I walk around it. Chapter five, I walk down another street. We all have deep holes that we fall into. Those things quickly send us into a depression where we don't want to do anything or talk to anyone. For some of us, that hole may be relationships, sports, grades, or family dynamics. Maybe it's what someone else has said or done or something we have done, but God always provides a way and the power to avoid these holes that Satan so desperately wants us stuck in. Let's go back to Elijah's story and see how he fell deeper and deeper in to his depression. These are the same tactics that Satan uses to continue to make someone a prisoner of their emotions. His strategy is this. Number one, focus on feelings rather than facts. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. He came to a tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. Elijah felt like a failure because of one incident that frightened him. Since he felt like a failure, then surely he must be, right? I feel it, so it must be true. Isn't that what we do all the time? The only catch is that feelings are not always true. 
You may feel far from God, but that does not mean you are. You may feel like you're a failure, like your life has no purpose, like no one cares about you. But the truth is, God says you're valuable. He has a plan for you, and you are well-loved. I heard a pastor friend say once, feelings are much like waves. We can't stop them from coming, but we can choose which ones to serve. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. 1 John 3.20 Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. Proverbs 28.26 Satan's strategy number two, comparing yourself with others. Many of us have fallen us into the, into the trap of thinking, if I could just be like so-and-so, I'd be happy. We also fall into the trap of comparing our weaknesses with other people's strengths. We forget that those other people have other weaknesses, areas where we may be strong. Take my life, Lord, I'm no better than my ancestors, Elijah said in 1 Kings 19.4. Satan's strategy number three is taking on false blame. In 1 Kings 19.10, the prophet Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. After three and a half years for God, things still hadn't gotten better. Elijah blamed himself for Israel's lack of growth and for all the Israelites who had died. In the same way, we tend to assume a ton of responsibility that is not ours to bear. Water break. We worry about things we can't change, we feel guilty when outcomes aren't our fault, and we hate ourselves for situations that are beyond our control. The burden God asks you to carry is light. Life is not always easy, but for the believer, the burdens of God come with his assistance. He gives us a burden for people, for situations, and for the loss, but he helps us carry the load with his presence. If you're carrying a lot of emotional weight or taking on blame, it's time to ask yourself if you're holding the wrong burden. Number four in Satan's strategy is exaggerate the negatives. In 1 Kings 19 said, Elijah said, I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. Really, Elijah, you're the only one left, and everyone's trying to kill you? In reality, there was only one person against him, Jezebel, and he wasn't the only one serving the Lord. There were 7,000 who still hadn't bowed to Baal in 1 Kings 19.18. Philippians 4.8 tells us what our focus should be. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This begs the question, where are you placing your emphasis? Nearly all attacks on your joy and happiness stem from one of these four things, focusing on feeling rather than facts, comparing yourself with others, taking on false blame, and exaggerating the negatives. But let me ask you this. When you're feeling down and depressed, or if you're feeling that way right now, how is your relationship with God going? When was the last time you spent time reading and studying and thinking about the Bible? Have you been serving God in some way recently? When you aren't in the word or you aren't serving or you're not growing in your walk with God, you start to feel distant from him. It becomes easier and more accessible for Satan to attack you in these four ways. There's another tool the enemy uses and most of us carry it around all day. I'm gonna dive into the effects of phone uses and its link to poor mental health in chapter six. But first, let's talk about mixing some things up. Buckle up. Chapter five, audit your life. Every year or so, I audit my life. It wasn't my idea, but I think it's a good one. The process allows me to monitor the areas in my life to ensure they're healthy. It's kind of an ongoing experiment. I know I'll never arrive, but I try to make small, purposeful changes every so often to get me closer to my goals. Everything except my marriage, kids, and relationship with God is up for discussion and modification. For example, one area that I audit is my finances. If I notice I'm paying a lot of money for my streaming subscriptions, I'll do a deep dive into what I'm actively using and drop ones I don't use often enough. Do I really need Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus all at the same time? Canceled. I have a friend who recommends drivers shop for car insurance every couple years. He believes that we could be leaving money on the table by holding some unspoken loyalty to a company. These are the few of the ways I now audit my bills and finances to optimize my spending and saving habits. Another area I recently got good at auditing was my time and creative energy. I noticed at work that I would spend the first part of my day catching up on emails, editing documents, returning phone calls, and scheduling meetings. Then by two or three in the afternoon, I was ready to dive into creative work like designing content or writing. But in theory, that's a good practice to have, but I was fried by then, kind of like I am right now. And my brain wasn't producing the best, most creative work. So I flipped my day. I'm sharp and alert. The creative juices flow between 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. I start my days now with my most creative challenges, a graphic that needs to be created, a curriculum that needs to be structured, or content that needs to be written. The administrative work that doesn't require as much creativity gets the focus at the end of the day. I also notice I get another lightning bolt of creative energy around 9 p.m., so I carve out some time to work on other passion projects. In the following few chapters, I'm going to ask you to audit a few areas of your life. 
in many ways, depression is unpreventable and there's no rhyme or reason to why it's occurring in your life. I make no attempts to explain away your struggle or manufacture solutions for something I cannot begin to understand. My words won't fix every issue. However, there are some universal things that we as believers can check in on. Another word for this auditing process could be pruning. In John 15, the Bible describes Jesus as a gardener who trims away branches that don't produce fruit and are dead on the vine. Is it possible there are some areas of your life that need pruning? Let's take a look. Chapter 6. The device is destroying you. I've got a breaking news update for you. Eating too many Krispy Kreme donuts, which is the best kind of donut, by the way, will make you fat. Shocker, right? This fact may surprise no one. We know that eating sugary, greasy foods isn't healthy. Similarly, many researchers are becoming wise that culturally anxiety and depression are on the rise in young people. In 2019, the shocking news broke. New research provides evidence that some form of screen time are linked to increased anxiety and depression symptoms among adolescents. It is very common to talk to our children about the negative consequences of alcohol use, smoking, and unsafe sex. However, nowadays, adolescents spend six to seven hours in front of a digital screen, exposing themselves to information potentially dangerous for their mental health, said study author Elroy Bowers, a postdoctoral research at the University of Montreal. To my knowledge, fewer parents talk to their children about the potential negative consequences of screen time. More awareness is needed. The researchers examined data from 3,659 children surveyed annually between 7th and 10th grade. The teens were asked to self-report time spent in front of digital screens and specify the time spent using social media, television, video games, and computers. The results were then published in the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry, and they found that a higher than average frequency of social media use, television viewing, and computer use over that four-year period predicted more severe symptoms of anxiety. Another analysis of the same data, published in the JAMA Pediatrics, found that a higher than average frequency of social media and television viewing predicted more severe symptoms of depression over the four-year time frame. Both findings highlight the negative consequences of some type of screen time on adolescents' mental health. One of the reports says, two longitudinal studies have shown a robust effort, effect of screen time on symptoms of depression and anxiety. Thus, parents, pediatrics, uh, I'm sorry, thus parents, pediatricians, medics, and developers of health interventions aiming to reduce, prevent anxiety and depression among adolescents should take screen time into account as one of the triggers of anxiety and depression. It is still unclear why some forms of screen time are associated with anxiety and depression while others are not. For example, playing video games was not a predictor of either depression or anxiety, possibly because gaming has become more of a social activity. Compared with their forerunners 15 to 20 years ago, the average video gamer is not socially isolated. It has been shown that more than 70% of gamers play their games with a friend, either physically together or online. The researchers also found evidence that interacting with media that promoted upward social comparisons was associated with reductions in self-esteem, which in turn was associated with increased depressive symptoms. The most important caveat is that we believe that content is key. However, we did not examine the content yet. I do not believe that the simple act of engaging in screen time has negative consequences, but what adolescents expose themselves to while engaging in screen time. Thus, Future research should focus on what kind of content triggers anxiety and depression in adolescents, the researcher Bowers explained. The effect of screen activities is unmistakable. The more times, the more time, the effect of screen activities is unmistakable. The more time teens spend looking at screens, the more likely they are to report symptoms of depression. Other studies done among the eighth graders have shown that heavy social media users increase their risk of depression by 27%, while those who play sports, go to religious services, or even do homework more than the average teen significantly cut their risk. Teens who spend three hours a day or more on electronic devices are 35% more likely to have a risk factor towards suicide, such as making a suicide plan. That's much more than risk related to, say, just watching TV. One piece of data that indirectly but stunningly captures kids growing isolation for good and for bad is this. Since 2007, the homicide rate among teens has declined, but the suicide rate has increased. As teens have started spending less time together, they've become less likely to kill one another and more likely to kill themselves. In 2011, for the first time in 24 years, the teen suicide rate was higher than the teen homicide rate. Depression and suicide have many causes. Too much technology is clearly not the only one. And the teen suicide rate was even higher in the 1990s, long before smartphones, smartphones existed. Then again, about four times as many Americans now take antidepressants. 
effective and often effective in treating severe depression, the type most strongly linked to suicide. I would propose that you take some time away from your phone. Ideally, researchers have found that more than two hours a day of screen time can be met mentally detrimental. If you can't go that long right now, I would do the same thing we do to infants who are weaning off of milk. Do less and less at a time until you find yourself at a healthier place. Substitution can be a helpful tactic too. Find a small book you can carry around and use it instead of your phone. By putting something else in your pocket, you can practice leaving your phone in a drawer for an hour at a time. This may sound stupid to you right now. It sounds kind of strange even as I say it, but I'm speaking from experience. I went through a social media detox a few years ago myself. One tactic I used to retrain my hands helped me a lot. I cut a small piece of scrap wood about the size of an iPhone and I put it in my pocket. I felt like I had my phone on me. Every time I reached for my phone, I got a block of wood instead. My point is this, your device is killing you. I don't mean in a conspiracy theory, 5G radiation kind of way. I mean, a lot of the tactics that Elijah from the previous chapter had to fight with are being introduced to you every day through your phone, focusing on feelings rather than facts, blaming, taking on false blame, comparing yourself with others and exaggerating the negatives. All of these can and are brought about through social media. Ditch the phone for a while and see what happens. Here's a quick, quick punch list to help. Enable a screen time app with a two hour time limit. Delete apps that you're reliant on or at least move them several pages deep in your home screen. Practice leaving the phone at home when you go out for short periods. Get a dummy device to take the place of the feeling in your pocket. Someone made one called the no phone for this exact reason. Find substitutes for content, content consumption. Use the Bible app more, fill your Spotify playlist with worship music, get a book to carry around to feed your mind in a healthier way. Bottom line, start setting healthier boundaries to feed your soul instead of providing the constant desire to be connected. If you had a negative toxic friend in your life that was constantly negative, exposed you to all kinds of unhealthy things, gave you bad advice and distracted you from the purpose of God in your life, I would tell you to ditch them in a heartbeat and not look back. Unfortunately, many of us carry around connections to all of the above every day. It's unfair of me to ask you to totally ditch your phone. I get it, it's how we stay connected today. Still, figure out a way to back it down. Chapter seven, close the door. When the movie Toy Story was nearing completion, several of the creators of the movie gathered for lunch with one purpose, to figure out what's next. When they were done with the story, what would they create? Several ideas were birthed, ideas that would later develop into A Bug's Life, Finding Nemo, Wally, -E, and one of my all-time favorite movies, Monsters, Inc. Seriously, even as an adult, I loved the movie so much that for a while, my iPhone lock screen code was 2319. If you know, you know. The film centers on two monsters, James P. Sullivan and his one-eyed partner and best friend, Mike Wazowski. The two are employed at the energy producing factory Monsters, Inc., which generates power by scaring human children. The monster world believes that the human children are toxic, so when a little human girl sneaks into the factory, she must be returned home before it's too late. There's a whole subplot in the movie about the danger that the monsters face every day by stepping through the doors into the human world. In one scene, the CEO of Monsters, Inc., Mr. Waternoose, observes the training of new recruits. The trainer goes over the tape of a recent training exercise with the recruits. Can anyone tell me Mr. Biles' big mistake? Anyone? Let's take a look at the tape. Here we go, right here. See the door? You left it wide open. And leaving the door open is the worst mistake any employee can make because it could let in a draft. Mr. Waternoose emerges from the shadows. It could let in a child. There's nothing more toxic or deadly than a human child. A single touch could kill you. Leave a door open and a child could walk right into this factory, right into the monster world. Of course, as we learned through the course of the movie, human children are not toxic. It was all a corporate cover-up. There is something to be said, though, of the cautionary approach to leaving doors open. You may think this correlation is absurd. You may say, well, we don't navigate our lives every day in danger of stepping into a portal to a dangerous universe. I would argue that we do. This looks different than the Pixar portrayal, but the truth is there's a spiritual realm behind everything. I've referenced this in a previous chapter, but today I ask you to audit this area. In other words, check your doors. Every day of our life, we interact with different doors, different choices that open or close other options in our lives. In Deuteronomy 30, 15 and 18, Moses challenges the people of Israel as they step into a new season as a nation. So you have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I command you today, by loving the Lord your God, by walking in his ways and by keeping his commandments, his statutes and his rules, you shall live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away 
and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you will surely perish. There's life and death before us every day, and a choice ultimately determines where our hearts end up. Think deeply about areas of your life where there's an opportunity for an open door to death. As dramatic as that sounds, there's a strong dark effect that certain things can have on us. Here's a few areas. Number one, the people we hang out with. Years ago, I had a friend who I would do lunch with every once in a while. He went through a rough patch in his marriage, and at almost every lunch we had for a while, he would complain about his marriage and even talk about how easy it would be for him to split up with his wife and go find someone new. That affected me. Even though at the time I was happy in my marriage, the proximity to that friend and the tones of our conversation began to plant seeds of discontentment and restlessness in my heart. Because of the person I was spending so much time with, I began to allow an open door of death in my mindset about my marriage. Although easier said than done, at the end of the day, I had to cut ties with this friend and stop seeing him for meals. The friendship wasn't worth the open door. There's a saying I heard a long time ago, and I often repeat it, especially when talking to young people about their influences. Show me your five closest friends, and I'll show you your future. Like it or not, you become like those you hang around. Number two area is the movies and the shows we watch. I'm not saying everyone needs to hold themselves to only watching G-rated content, but what you fill your mind with matters. Evaluate what's coming into your eyes regularly. There's obvious bad stuff like pornographic content, but my concern is that we allow a compromise in the areas where it's a bit gray, especially with online streaming. My kids started watching YouTube around four years old. My oldest daughter, Bella, started watching a channel that started off doing toy unboxing videos. The videos were not inherently evil. There wasn't any witchcraft, incantations, foul language, or inappropriate content. However, the kid who started the channel frequently had a bad attitude towards his parents and displayed a playful rebellion in many of his videos. Guess what we started noticing in our daughter? She began showing glimpses of that same attitude and seemingly innocent surface level, level rebellion. We had allowed an open door. Slam. <laughs> we shut that one quick and blocked YouTube altogether in our home. I have the same approach to horror films. They make me breathe faster, clench my fists, and dream some lousy stuff at night. Why would I want that? Is the open door that I'm inviting worth the 120 minutes of entertainment? Nope. Think about the standard of visual content that you consume. What can you do about those unhealthy doors? Similarly, the music we listen to plays a huge part in our mental health. Hear me, I'm not, I'm not attempting to be like the legalistic Pentecostal preachers of the 90s who only want you to listen to Christian radio and hymns. I'm simply asking, have you evaluated the music you listen to? Is it feeding your soul darkness or light? What door is your music opening? What does your Spotify Top 100 listen to look like? Is it the kind of stuff that builds you up or discourages you? Fourthly is the accounts we follow. Chances are you're probably familiar with the idea of social media algorithms. Just in case this is a foreign concept, let me throw past you a kitchen table social media algorithm definition. Social media algorithms are a way of sorting posts in a user's feed based on relevancy instead of the published time. Social networks prioritize which content users see in their feeds first by the likelihood that they'll want to see it. Before the switch to algorithms, most social media feeds displayed posts in reverse chronological order. The newest posts from the accounts that users followed showed up first. Setting your feed to chronological order is still an option on a lot of platforms. By default, social media algorithms take the reins of determining which content to deliver to you based on your behavior. For example, Facebook or Twitter might put posts from your closest friends and family front and center in your feed because those are the accounts you interact with the most often. Chances are you've been recommended videos to watch on YouTube, right? This is, again, based on your individual behavior, digging into what you've watched in the past and what users like you are watching. Elements such as categories, hashtags, and keywords also factor into recommended content on any given network. Here's what it comes down to. Your social media presence is an open door to what you interact with. For example, my Instagram Reels feed is filled with cooking videos and church preaching sound bites. Why? Because those are the accounts that I follow and interact with. <laughs> If you're opening TikTok or Instagram and having a flood of trashy content, I would ask you to evaluate the types of account you follow. What doors do you have open in your social media accounts? Every day, you're feeding your mind and soul from your scroll. Is there nutritional value in what you're consuming? In the previous chapter, I asked you to audit your device usage. Continuing in that vein, I ask you to deep dive into your social media presence. It may be time for a purge. Unfollow a bunch of accounts that represent an unhealthy open door, or even delete your account and start over. Then this last one should be obvious, but I'm still going to talk about it. Willful sin. Habitual sin in your life is a massive open door to death. The Bible clearly states that in the end, the payment or the wages of sin is death. 
One of my mentors, Steve Hill, used to say, sin will take you farther than you ever wanted to go, keep you longer than you wanted to stay, and cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. A simple biblical definition of sin is this. Sin is any transgression of or failure to observe God's commandments. If he tells someone do this and the person doesn't do it, he sins. If God says don't do that and the person does it, he sins. Sin is disobedience. Every door we open has an unseen cost. One Sunday after service, my church had a time of prayer. A young man in his early 20s asked to pray with me. He shared some things he was struggling with in his thought life, some confusion he was working through regarding his future, some mental barriers of disbelief he was trying to break. In our brief conversation, it came out that his parents disapproved of his relationship with his girlfriend, so he had moved out of their house and moved in with her. He claimed, to be a he claimed to be a believer, so I shared with him that it seemed like he had an open door of sin in his life by doing that. He immediately began to justify his decision, that they could not afford to live separately and that it just made sense. He even went so far as to tell me that he had already talked to God about this living together situation, and God said that he was okay with it. Yikes. Now, not only there was an open door, but he'd started justifying it as no big deal. You may read the above interaction and say, well, duh, how obvious, that was wrong. But all of us have sins, big and small, that we tolerate or justify every single day. The ones I listed here may not be the only doors that exist. I encourage you to think through the things that you do. If there's any chance you have a door open that could be letting darkness into your life, clean house. Do a little spiritual CSI, crime scene investigation, and at the root of the struggle, there could be a pattern or broken connection to God. Figure out where things started going south and trace your steps back. Every door is an invitation for things to enter our lives. The good news is there's a better door. There is a door to life and to light. Jesus says in John 10, 7 through 11, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I'm the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I'm the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We have a shepherd leading us, the sheep, into good places. It's not only about avoiding the bad doors. It's about clinging to the one who leads us into the right doors. Fill your mind with things that bring you closer to him. Listen to an audio Bible in the Bible app or download the free Hoopla app and listen to audiobooks there. If you're in a rut with your Bible reading, switch to a different translation. Fill your Spotify or Apple Music account with worship. Start with Maverick City Music, Upper Room, Elevation, or Rick Pino, just to name a few. Sub subscribe to some churches on YouTube to see great messages and fill your soul with Bible teaching. Read or listen to Caroline Leaf books. Read or listen to Goliath Must Fall by Louis Giglio. This list is not an end all to spiritual growth. Find some sources of life near you and begin to open doors to more spiritually healthy nourishment. If you're in a church family, talk to your pastor or youth pastor about some resources to get you started. As a youth pastor, one of my favorite types of text messages to get was along the lines of, hey, I'm dealing with unforgiveness. Can you recommend some books or Bible studies in version?" Chapter eight, where's the limp? When Alexandra of Denmark appeared on British soil, she was a 19th century superstar. Flocks of people gathered around her whenever she stepped outside. As the wife of King Emperor Edward VII, she became queen of the United Kingdom and the British dominions and Empress of India from 1901 to 1910. Like any modern day celebrity, Alexandra had legions of fans who wanted to dress and act just like her. Think of how our society idolizes the Kardashians and you can imagine how people responded. For example, she had a scar on her neck from a childhood accident. To hide it, she wore choker necklaces. Although she had a specific non-fashion related reason for the chain, upper class women across the kingdom started copying her look. Sometimes her fans took things a little too far. After giving birth to her third child in 1867, Alexandra contracted a nasty bout of rheumatic fever. While she recovered, the fever left her with a noticeable limp. As a result, a strange craze swept the nation. High society women in cities like London and Edinburgh started limping everywhere. They lived around the house, down the street, and on their way to tea and back again. To give their handicap a realistic look, ladies wore mismatched uneven shoes, one high, one low. Walking canes also suddenly became a chic accessory. Things got even worse when merchants started selling uneven shoes so that ladies could limp effortlessly. An entire subset within the shoe industry was created. Shoemakers crafted, crafted uneven shoes so that the wearer would have a built-in limp. The women didn't have a natural limp. They were so focused on mimicking Alexandra that they began to live life worse off. The side effect of a deadly illness in one person became a fashion statement that others wanted to copy. 
I want to propose an idea to you. Hopefully, you spent enough time with me through the chapters of this book to understand my heart. I'm not attempting to write off or minimize your struggle, but I do have to ask, do you have a limp that's not yours? Although many of us struggle with anxiety and depression that's not a phase or a mindset, there are some who have begun to wear a label simply because other people do. It's possible that you have a healthy, vibrant mind with a joyful heart, but you're looking at some people with a limp. Maybe you're taking on struggles that you don't need to. Please know I'm here for you and I only want the best for you. I do, however, want to make sure you check your shoes. Have you made life more challenging than it has to be because you're hanging around a bunch of friends who insist they are depressed all the time? If so, everyone around you probably has a limp and it leaves you feeling like you have a limp too. I'm gonna to dive a little deeper here and at the risk of frustrating you, let me explain. After we led the depression series in our youth ministry in the spring of 2018, we started growing as a group. It was not uncommon to have seven to 10 first time visitors on an average Wednesday night. In a group of 30, that was a lot. We started our Wednesday night services with an open mic time. At first, it was out of necessity because our worship leader could not lead worship at the beginning of the new service because of a competing commitment. I realized that games where two or three kids throw a Cheeto into whipped cream and everyone else watches weren't helping. They also didn't need to come into a room after a long, stressful school day and be preached at right away. So as a form of social lubricant and a way to kill 15 minutes in a healthy way, we introduced a new topic or trending story and invited the kids to talk about it. One week, we talked about sexual identity and parents who were giving their 9, 10, 11-year-old kids hormone treatments to switch to their gender. The room got awkward and understandably so. The majority of kids in the room knew someone who, were, who was undergoing that therapy and the church overall historically has handled those conversations very poorly. One girl slowly raised her hand. If I know a friend from school who was born a girl but is transitioning to a boy and I wanted to invite them to church, how would they feel if they came here? I paused and I took a lot of, I took a lot of valuable courses in ministry school, but this one wasn't, this question wasn't in any of them. Well, I took a deep breath to stall for time while I figured out how to articulate what was in my heart. Although I personally would disagree with the choices that they or their parents are making, I want everyone who walks through the doors of this youth group to know that Jesus loves them. I would want people to feel like they can belong here before they believe. The room erupted in applause. I wasn't sure if that was normal or not. We were still kind of new. I continued, church is a family, and if we can't love people who don't believe exactly like us, then we're doing something wrong. After the service, I talked to a lot of kids who were still wrestling with what I had said. How can we tolerate sin in such close proximity? My answer was because Jesus did. He loved people well without compromising his truth or his mission. We made, you can belong before you believe, a part of our group mantra. In a culture where many youth groups suffer from closed off cliques and isolating friend circles, this was a breath of fresh air to many. We printed that phrase on a shirt and launched a summer small group campaign around it. An offhanded comment about how we approach people who believe differently than us became a core value. We established a group culture of family overproduction. Kids started showing up in droves and our group exploded in numbers. We went from 30 to 50 in a few months and then 50 to 80. Week after week, we had at least one visitor who was a part of the LGBTQ plus community in our city. Gay, bi, transgender, or gender dysphoric teenagers kept coming. Not all of them stayed, but many of them did. One girl, we'll call her Tina, was raised Catholic, but was attracted to the family atmosphere and the presence of God that she experienced at our church. She first came to group because she was in love with a girl who attended our church. They had met at school. No judgment there for me. I initially went to youth group growing up because I was attracted to some hot girls as well. The only difference is that Tina was bisexual. She told me for the first time in her life, she didn't feel attacked or condemned at church for being openly bi over dating other girls. Tina's honesty, curiosity, and newness to faith were refreshing. I made it a point to connect with her in a very intentional way. She often showed up early because her crush was on the worship team and the worship team showed up early too. Tina ended up chatting in the foyer with a few leaders and myself most weeks before service. One week in a pre-service chat, we were talking about sexuality and gender identity. Tina was expressing frustration as a freshman at her school who had suddenly decided that they were transgender. She described how flippantly people were treating gender. People who didn't take her seriously were even more put off by kids who played around with the idea of gender and sexuality. To her, she had really worked through her identity and her struggles. She hadn't, but she was convinced of who she was at that point. She said that those poser kids were a bunch of trans trenders. What? I'd never heard that term. You mean transgenders? No, trans trender, she said, meaning they just realized they can get more attention if they call themselves trans 
So they slap that label on themselves. They don't mean it. They have no intention of truly switching gender. Everyone is doing it, so they jump on the bandwagon. It's so frustrating. They realized that the limp was getting attention, so they feigned gender dysphoria in an attempt to garner attention and be cool. It, listen, it's not the point of this audiobook to dive into the issues or theology of gender, dys gender dysphoria. That's another book for another time. If you do want to dive into it, I highly recommend a book by Caleb Kaltenbach, Messy Grace, How a Pastor with Gay Parents Learned to Love Others Without Sacrificing Conviction. I lost Tina. I lost touch with Tina after graduation. I pray that I was able to plant some truth in her heart. And though I'm not sure where she stands with the Lord or her identity today, our conversations did stick with me. The point of her story about trans trenders is to help illustrate this idea that people will throw themselves into painful, inconvenient situations because of what they're looking at. Who are you looking at? Who or what is influencing your limp? And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, 2 Corinthians 3.18. Sanctification, the transformation of being made holy, is brought about by focusing our attention on God. When we see more of who God is, our awe and our affection grow too. Put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. We are renewed in knowledge. Knowledge of God and his ways comes by turning our eyes upon scripture. Reading through these scriptures reminds me of an old hymn my parents' church used to sing. It's a song that beckons us to focus our eyes on Jesus. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Chapter 9, The Way Out Is Not What You Think. Trigger warning, this chapter deals with suicide. If you can't handle that topic, skip this section. A young pastor preached about depression and then killed himself. His widow wants to help others by talking about it. That was a headlight from the Los Angeles Times, December 4th, 2018. The article continues. The preacher wore black skinny jeans and a wireless microphone clipped to his ear. He looked like he was giving a TED talk, gesturing with his hands as he stood next to a large projector. Pastor Andrew Stockman recounted the Old Testament story of the prophet Elijah, whose despair led him to pray for death. The prophet's the prophet, Stockland, told the large congregation at Inland Hills Church in Chino, California, was filled with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. You see mental illness on display, Stockland said. Now that's something we don't like to talk about much, do we? Especially not in the church. A tall 30-year-old with a surfer dude accent and tattoos covering his right arm, Stockland had just returned to the pulpit from a four-month leave of absence in which he battled panic attacks and severe depression. This was the first series of... First in a series of sermons about mental illness, he titled Hot Mess. He clicked through suicide statistics on the screen. He listed resources. He implored his congregation to know that if they were fighting mental illness, they weren't alone. There is hope and there is help available, the pastor said. Twelve days later, he killed himself. One of the top ten causes of death in the United States, suicide saw its rate rise in 49 states from 1999 to 2016, according to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. In 2016 alone, nearly 45,000 people died by suicide. But the topic is often avoided in the church, said Ed Stetzer, who's the executive director of the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College in Illinois. People often see anxiety and depression as problems fixable with prayer alone. We put mental illness in the category of spiritual struggles, Stetzer said. We wouldn't have shame towards someone who broke their leg or had asthma or leukemia. In the years to follow, Kayla, Andrew's wife, publicly tells the story of losing her best friend, her husband, and father of her two beautiful children to mental illness. She's honest about the time before and after this tragic loss and what it was like to tell her three beautiful boys that daddy is gone. In the years to follow, Kayla, Andrew's wife, publicly tells the story of losing her best friend, husband, and father of her children to mental illness. She's honest about the time before and after this tragic loss and what it was like to tell her three beautiful boys that daddy was gone. Nearly 800,000 people die by suicide in the world each year. That's one death every 40 seconds, and 90% of suicide attempts are impulsive. Kayla discusses with great emotion the impacts that this tragedy has had on her family and on her. She also discusses in detail several different strategies that should be employed when someone is suffering from mental illness. There's a stigma around mental illness, especially towards people of faith. We often think that suicide is selfish. Kayla will tell you that this is a college falsehood and something she is passionate about correcting. She was very vocal in the weeks following Andrew's death about how he was processing, about how she was processing his life and death. She described him as a man who loved God, loved reading the word, and loved worship. So many often think that that's enough. That we can pray away the suicidal thoughts and depression. God will carry us in our darkest moments, but we also need to work to remove the stigma that mental illness can remain untreated. 
when I took my driver's ed course at age 17, my drive, my parents noticed I had a hard time reading street signs as a, at a reasonable distance. I'm having a hard time reading this book. Sure enough, a visit to the eye doctor proved I was nearsighted. I prayed for my eyes to be healed. I commanded the blurriness to go in Jesus name. And now I just drive anyway, living in faith that I'll get to my destination safely and not cause any accidents or traffic violations. Could you imagine if that was true? What a crazy mentality. The truth is I do pray for my eyes to be healed and whole, but I also wear glasses every day. My wife, my children, and my coworkers are thankful. If you're reading this today and you're struggling with suicidal thoughts or actions, I'm begging you, please tell someone. You don't, if you don't have anyone to call, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline by dialing 988. You are not designed to battle depression and mental illness alone. You need people and people need you. Your life is worth fighting for. Your journey's not over. And the deep, overwhelming pain that you're feeling won't last forever. Your life has a divine purpose. And there are more people cheering you on than you could ever know. The world needs you. Your family needs you. And your future needs you. It's a myth to believe that when you have faith in God, you will not have suicidal thoughts. Depression is a disorder of the brain that is both biological and physio physiological. We need help to break this stigma of mental illness. Although prayer and spirituality may help and God can do miracles, ultimately, mental illness deserves to be treated just like every other illness. It's been said, we know a drop in the ocean of the brain. Who are we to judge one single drop in a vast open sea? I believe God has not called us to judge mental illness or suicide. Rather, he's called us to love him and to love them. And he meant all of them. Kayla references a song that's helped carry her through her darkest moments, Rescue by Lauren Daigle. I believe it can help you too. God sees you, God hears you, God knows your darkest thoughts, and God's got you in the palm of his hand. Take a moment, look up the song in your favorite streaming service, or I'll put the, the link below in this, in this video as well. It's a powerful cry to God. I don't have all the right things to say about suicide, and this chapter is not an attempt to pretend to know the answer or give you some deep theological dive into it. I cannot imagine what you're facing if you struggle with the thought of taking your own life or, or if you've lost a loved one to suicide. Talk to someone. Call the number 988. The woods are dark, but there's a way out you may not see. Talk to someone, please. Chapter 10, Evict the Tiger. In 2006, in Minnesota, 52-year-old Cynthia Lee Gamble was found dead in her home. It's not uncommon for investigators to receive calls from concerned neighbors that lead them to finding a dead body, but this time was different. Cynthia was found mauled to death inside a giant cage alongside a 500-pound Bengal tiger. Cynthia was no stranger to deadly animals. She had raised and cared for the tiger since it was a young cub. In fact, she had raised multiple large predators for over 10 years at her home, along with her 14-year-old son. She'd never had an issue that entire time, certainly not one that warranted a call from the sheriff's department. Until this time, this time the tiger had gotten out of control. What was once, man what was once manageable and containable became too much, and it killed her. The same thing happens with our fears and anxiety. They start small, cuddly, cute, comfortable. We aren't experiencing panic attacks, extreme fear, or deep depression, so we say it's not a big deal. We can manage. Sure, it's a tiger, but it's a little baby one. Here's the danger with leaning only on coping mechanisms when dealing with anxiety. Eventually, the baby anxiety grows up and gets bigger. While there are tools and resources to better manage our anxiety, I speak in favor of many of them in other chapters. Our goal should not be just to keep the tiger happy. It should be to evict him. And if your tiger is already fully grown, it's not too late. Whatever giant we're battling may be significant, but it's not bigger than Jesus. I dealt with a bout of anxiety and depression in a way I never had before. I brushed it off. It was an unusual, weird feeling. I was sleeping less. I had a lot more anger and fear than I had ever had previously. It was January of 2020, right before the pandemic hit. I brushed it off because after all, at that time I was a pastor. I'd never dealt with anxiety. I, I was a champion for Jesus. My faith, my mind was strong. At least that's what I kept telling myself. Little baby tiger cub. Sure, it may not have been full-blown depression or clinical anxiety, but it was different. I was laughing, laughing less than I used to. I was becoming increasingly hostile and critical. I was seeing problems in every promise. I, I amplified the negative and I dismissed the positive. Then in the spring of 2020, the pandemic was in full swing and it got even worse. My hair started falling out in clumps in the shower. I started having weird nightmares. I cried a lot more for no reason. Then in May, 
may remember this, Carl Lentz of Hillsong Church, New York, had a moral failure. He was one of my heroes. I had literally had a book from him on my nightstand that I had just finished reading a few months earlier not, that he wrote, not from him, but we had waited in line for hours in 2013 to see him preach live in Manhattan at his church. If Carl Lentz, a mighty preacher and an influential leader could fall to temptation, was I next? That one did a number on me. I cried a lot in the shower in May that year as clumps of hair inexplicably fell out of my head. Listen, if you think your tiger is manageable and cute right now, ask if these questions ring true. Are you laughing less than you used to? Are the people around you seeing you become increasingly negative and critical? Are you seeing problems in every promise? Do you amplify the negative and dismiss the positive? Do you feel the life squeezed out of you, the joy being sucked from your soul? The word anxiety in Latin literally means to choke. I challenge you to do some work to evict the tiger in this chapter. It'll take you getting real and admitting that this cute cub can't stick around, that it's not okay. I started seeing a counselor in spring of 2020. I was financially broke. My wife and I had no extra spending money. I didn't have insurance that covered mental health care. I got frustrated knowing that I needed help disposing of this tiger, but not having access to anyone who knew how to handle it. Fortunately, I found a place in our community that helps people in my situation. I explained to my counselor, I'll call him Glenn, where I was at. At the time, I didn't feel like I was dying in a car crash, but that I could hear my brakes squeaking and I knew something needed to be addressed before it got worse. Glenn accepted me as a patient and began working with me. I visited him for 18 months to work through my stuff. I didn't get perfect, and Glenn didn't save me or make me an angelic little cherub who floats above all life's problems, but we worked through some stuff. I took away tangible tools to help me. In one session, Glenn pointed out a flawed way of thinking that I had held on to since childhood, and no one had ever called me out on it before. Another time, when I was venting about some frustrating things that were happening in my life, Glenn cussed me out, literally dropped an F-bomb on me. It, was, it shocked me because Glenn used to be in ministry as well, but it felt necessary to kind of shake me out of my mindset. I would never have known how to deal with my depression if I, wasn't, if I had admitted that something shouldn't have been there lurking. To be honest, I'm still working through evicting my tiger. I'm not finished yet, but I refuse to ignore him and pretend it's okay anymore. To beat an adversary, we have to acknowledge it. I'm not necessarily talking about clinical anxiety. It's more of a, a rising tide, a phenomenon across the board in society. It's how I described Piglet at the beginning of this book, generalized anxiety. Let's zoom in on that for a second. It's no mystery that we have a national anxiety crisis. I'm not gonna win any awards or get a show on TBN for being a prophet for pointing that out. In his book, Unwinding Anxiety, Judson Brewer points out the current state of affairs. With the emergence of the COVID-19 pandemic, early estimates, estimates report, surprise, that anxiety levels skyrocketed. A cross-sectional survey of people in China from February 2020 found the prevalence of GAD to be 35.2%, and this was relatively early on in the grand scheme of the pandemic. A report from the UK from late April 2020 reported that mental health had deteriorated compared with pre-COVID-19 tens. Uh, pre-COVID-19 trends. A study in the United States in April 2020 found that 13.6% of respondents reported severe psychological distress. That's a whopping 250% increase compared to 2018, where only 3.9% reported this level of woe. You only have to look as far as your own experience or social media feed to confirm this for yourself. Large-scale disasters such as COVID-19 are almost always accompanied by increases in a broad range of mental disorders, including substance use and anxiety. For example, nearly 25% of New Yorkers reported increasing their alcohol use after the 9-11 attack back in 2001, and six months after the 2016 Fort McMurray wildfire, the costliest disaster in Canadian history, area residents showed a spike to 19.8% in generalized anxiety disorder symptoms. It's also been shown that anxiety often travels with friends, namely depression. GAD rarely travels alone. It's time today to deal with the internal world. When the Apostle Paul wrote to believers in Philippi, he was writing about their mental state. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. I want everyone to see, let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your heart and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Wouldn't you love to trade your anxiety for God's peace? Let's take some advice from Paul on how we can evict the tiger of anxiety. Number one, celebrate God's goodness. 
we can choose what we fixate on. When you were a kid, did your parents ever repeat something to you, make sure you got it? Sometimes if we're not getting something, repetition is the key. And that's what Paul does here. Again, I say, rejoice. Number two, don't meditate on the mess. The more you stare at the problem, the bigger it gets. Goliath was not that big. I mean, nine feet tall, yes, that's big, but not that big. For the people of Israel, for some reason, they almost over-glorified his size by becoming super obsessed with it. Three, fix your thoughts. One way we can expel anxiety is to choose what we focus on. Let's read what Paul wrote in Philippians again. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of all peace will be with you. Have you ever noticed that the last thing someone says is usually pretty important? This is Paul's exclamation point on this passage and how I'll end this book as well. There's something important about how Paul chooses to end his letter, fix your thoughts. This is a powerful practice. Just think about Apple keynotes. They've become a cultural phenomenon. Executives at the tech company use annual keynote presentations to unveil new products, update shareholders, and release new company information. Something that Steve Jobs made popular was the idea of one more thing. He would finish the presentation, and as journalists began folding up their laptops, assuming the show was over, he would casually say, oh, just one more thing. Usually that one more thing was in fact not just an afterthought. It was a huge groundbreaking announcement that dominated headlines. Here's some examples of some products that were released at Apple Keynote's One More Things. The iPod Shuffle, remember that tiny little iPod? The MacBook Pro, the Apple TV, the little box, FaceTime, that video technology that we all know and love, and the Apple Watch, the one Apple product that I don't have on me. Uh, clearly, this practice of one more thing didn't begin with Apple Keynotes. It's what Paul used in his letter to the Philippians. The last thing he mentioned became the cornerstone of the whole conversation. Can you picture Paul in jeans and a black turtleneck? If he were speaking today, he might say, one final thing, fix your thoughts on what's true, honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Fixing your thoughts is a big deal. This is super important. Dr. Caroline Leaf is a Christian cognitive neuroscientist with a PhD in communication pathology specializing in neuropsychology. She has spent her life studying the way the believer's thought life correlates with what science has proven. She spends a lot of time pointing out the science of the mind is just now catching up with what scripture has already said. In her book, Switch on Your Brain, The Key to Peak Happiness, Thinking, and Health, Dr. Leaf writes, thoughts are real physical things that occupy mental real estate. Moment by moment, every day, you're changing the structure of your brain through your thinking. When we hope, it's an activity of the mind that changes the structure of our brain in a positive and normal direction. A big takeaway from both the above passage of scripture and the research from Dr. Leaf is that fixing our thoughts requires active effort. We don't passively change our thoughts. It takes focus and intentionality. I remember when my kids first started riding bikes with training wheels around like three or four, the neighborhood we lived in had wide streets, but no sidewalks. We would walk with them as they rode and try to make sure they stared near the curbs on the side of the street. At first, I would say, stay away from the middle to encourage them to avoid potential cars that were driving in the center of the street. I noticed after a while that those instructions did not work. If I saw them drifting and then said, stay away from the middle, suddenly their awareness and attention would focus on the middle of the street. Their gaze would shift to the middle of the road and their bikes would follow. I started trying something different and I noticed a change. Instead of mentioning the middle, I made it all about the curb, the edge of the road. Stay near the side, get closer to the curb. Their attention would shift, their gaze would shift to the side and the bikes would follow. Their focus determined their direction. It's the same with our thought life. So let me ask you this, where is your focus? This is a practice that can make or break a lot of areas. Consider a relationship that's on the rocks. You have a choice. You can inter internally tell yourself it's over, this will never recover, or you can think we have some work to do, but reconciliation is possible. How about a class in school that's becoming increasingly difficult? I'm too dumb for this, I'll never get it. Or my mind is sharp and ready to learn new things. How about when money is tight and finances aren't available for what we need? Do you think I'll always be broke? Or do you think time for a creative opportunity to produce some more income? Hopefully the choice is clear. Believing in possibility and opportunity and good outcomes affects your mental health. What's even better is when you speak that truth out loud. 
Sometimes I have to make my mouth say it, even if I don't think it. I have to force my brain to agree with what's coming out of my mouth. I'm, it's not that I'm lying to myself. It's that I'm elevating my mind from a depressed view to a happy, more positive view. Let me leave you with two keys to help with this, practical takeaways to help fix your thoughts. Um, number one, personal declarations. A few years ago, Craig Groeschel, the pastor of Life Dot Church, Life Church, shared a list of declarations that he wrote and recited every day. No matter how he feels that day, he's causing his mouth and his mind to come into alignment with truth rooted in God's word. These declarations are helpful for me, and as we close the chapter, I encourage you to use them too. This is how we evict the tiger. We quit looking at the middle of the street, and we cause our brains and mouths to come into alignment with what God says. It takes about six to ten minutes to get through these declarations. I keep them in a note in my phone and recite them almost every day. Read them out loud and take some time to fix your thoughts. I search them online, and I've even booked them on my phone home screen to read and declare at a moment's notice. Google Pastor Craig's Daily Declarations. I'll also leave a link in the comments or in the uh, description of this video. Number two, a gratitude list. How do we invite peace into our life? With thanksgiving, with gratitude, not a grumbling prayer. The truth is that anxiety and gratitude cannot share the same heart. Like oil and water, those two ideologies cannot coexist in the same space at the same moment. We are more likely to feel stressed and overwhelmed when we only focus on our problems. However, when I come to God in prayer and I'm around friends who love God, I realize how much I have and all the reason I have to give thanks. William James, an American philosopher and psychologist, once said the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose what we think about. I chose to change the focus of my thoughts from what, my problems, to whom, God. The result, it turns out that even in the middle of a challenging situation, we can count the blessings. God wants us to give thanks in all things, not only when things are going well, but also when we experience a lot of stress in life. If you're ever in a dark place, take a piece of paper and a pen and make a gratitude list, even though it may seem hard in the moment. In your lowest places, make a list of the good things. Even if you've lost your job, your marriage is crumbling, or something is going terribly wrong, Make a list of the good things. This is especially helpful for depression and anxiety. It does not minimize the struggle, but it is a, a nifty mindfulness technique that forces you to think super hard about things you might otherwise overlook. For example, I stopped procrastinating about mowing the yard. The fresh cut grass made mowing, the smell made mowing the grass worth it. When I drove to the store today, there wasn't a lot of traffic. The hot water in my house is working. I took a nice warm shower. One of my friends texted me and asked me how I was doing. I have a good friend who cares about me. It was warmer today, and I was watching the dust dance on a sunbeam in the living room. You get the idea. It can be the smallest, most minimal thing. However, when you're in a spiral and you think about all your good things, it forces you to be present and focus on the positive things in front of you, no matter how small they are. Be present and take a moment to think about your good things. Chapter 11, God is in control. Follow the script. During the summer of 2021, I was watching YouTube when an ad for an online university popped up. With the pandemic, the idea of working and studying from home was still fresh on everyone's mind. The commercial started with lots of COVID-themed videos, and then a deep Morgan Freeman-style Morgan Freeman voiceover started talking. In times like these, we look for control wherever we can find it. The commercial resonated with people who felt like COVID had taken away their control and stirred emotions in those who wanted to take it back, particularly regarding their education. They believed that by taking control, they would receive peace. It's common for us to think peace comes from control, but the Apostle Paul said it differently. For all of us A-type driven personalities, we've got to realize peace is in the process, in accepting that God is in control. I have good news. We can resign as ruler of the universe. If you've tried to find peace by controlling everything in your life, then practice saying this to God. God, it's your problem. It was mine. Now it's yours. The Apostle Paul addressed finding peace in the process of trusting God. If we go back to Philippians 4, he says, Keep putting into practice all you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. This is how the verse ends, but let's zoom back to how it began. And I'm certain God, who began a good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. That's Philippians 1, 6, the very beginning of the book. There's a theme here. We are part of a work in progress. It doesn't mean we should ignore hard things or sweep them under the rug, but we must realize we can't control our circumstances. We can, though, control what we think of them. Dr. Caroline Leaf addresses this. You cannot sit back and wait to be happy and healthy and have a great thought life. You have to make the choice to make this happen. 
You have to choose to get rid of the toxic and get back in alignment with God. You can be overwhelmed by every small setback in life, or you can be energized by the possibilities that they bring. Let's continue with the theme that we are works in progress. Hebrews 12 writes about this idea and Jesus being the author and finisher of our faith. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that set, was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Consider the role of actors versus the role of directors in a movie. Actors don't have all the details. They just follow their Role. They don't write the scripts. They just follow what's written and do what they can to bring their character alive. Think about that in the light of your life. You no longer have to hold the role of director. You can put in your two weeks notice as ruler of the universe. As we finish this book, I'm going to talk about three ways we can best embody our roles. A churchier way to say it would be keys to trusting God. These are big takeaways for walking this out daily. Number one, get into character. I covered this earlier in chapter seven, close the door, but let's revisit it. What you consume shapes how you think. Jenna Fisher, who played Pam from the US office, US version of The Office, talked about this in her podcast, Office Ladies, that she hosts with fellow actor Angela Kinsey. When the show first started, The Office, Fisher was totally broke, just getting started and acting full time in LA. She had a long drive to set each day, and she wanted to make sure she was embracing her role as Pam, a young Scranton receptionist. For her long drive, she created a CD of various songs that she believed her character would listen to. Fisher herself had once worked a lousy job as a receptionist, so she included some songs that she used to listen to in that time in her life. She described her time in that job as a moody, almost depressing season in her career, and when she listened to the throwback songs from that season, it took her back and prepared her mentally to play Pam. What music is going to help you get into character for what God is calling you to do? When I was a youth pastor, I developed playlists during the pandemic because I knew students were taking themselves to dark places mentally with some of their music choices. Again, I reference a lot of this in chapter seven, but it's worth repeating. At the time of this, uh, this writing, this new, those New Hope youth playlists are still on Spotify, so search for them. If they don't show up, I recommend, and I'll, I'll link all this below as well, Maverick City Music, some old, it's, it's a little older, but Will Reagan and United Pursuit, Jason Upton, Rick Pino, Lindy Kofer and the Circuit Riders, again, a throwback, but Keith Green, um, particularly the song, He'll Take Care of the Rest, it's dynamite to trust God. Second thing, get off the bench and get in the game. Another way to say this is to become a producer instead of a consumer. I have a, a bad habit when I get on my phone. I call it consuming by scrolling, especially at night in that weird after dinner but before bedtime. I've worked to become more intentional with that time. Instead of constantly consuming content, I pour time and energy into creating books and devotional resources. In fact, this book only happened because I started restructuring that evening time. That's partially because I have a goal to produce and write books, but it also helps me fix my thoughts. If I have something specific that I'm working on, I fix my thoughts in that direction. When I was writing this book on dealing with mental health battles God's way, guess what I thought about? Some of us went off the rails during quarantine because we didn't have any focus or direction. That's not how it has to be. We can help somebody, learn something new, write something, cook something, start a YouTube channel, take up a new hobby that glorifies God. My young friend, Caden Gibbs, did this. He was a student in our youth ministry in Abilene. He has a rare condition that causes his bones and muscles in his legs to grow improperly. He'd had many surgeries and he's experienced a lot of pain. In the sixth grade, Caden was a big solid guy at 6'2". The kid could have easily played varsity football. The only problem was he couldn't use his body. He had to sit often and he had limited physical activity. He was frustrated and devastated by this. He asked God, why would you build me this way and then make me suffer and not able to use the body you gave me? We spent many nights at the altars of our church praying and crying together. At some point, Caden decided to stop moping. He chose to direct his energy into new hobbies and new ventures that could utilize his heart and his gifts. He started beatboxing. He became really good at it and he entered local and regional statewide competitions. He started learning to play the bass on our youth worship team, an instrument that he could play sitting down. He started songwriting. He started singing. As I wrote this initially, I was crying, writing it out, remembering the nights when he'd sing about the goodness of God while sitting on a stool because he couldn't even stand up. Sitting down, immobilized to a degree, but still singing about how good God was. In the midst of frustration and God seeming to not answer his prayers, Caden chose 
to glorify God and uses time and energy to develop new gifts. Number three, renew your mind, change the way that you think. Don't copy the customs and behavior of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. Romans 12, 2. At one time, I thought this verse only had to do with like sin and bad thoughts. I learned, however, it has a lot to do with vision as well. I used to quote the verse about taking thoughts captive all the time, about dealing with bad thoughts, the verse in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, <coughs> excuse me, in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I didn't realize that God was calling me to not only cage bad thoughts, but also unleash his thoughts in my mind and let my imagination go wild again. During my season of dealing with anxiety, the Lord began to whisper it to my heart during my prayer time about dreams for the future. Three days prior to this instance, I had preached a message on an empty auditorium and a two camera video setup for our live stream Sunday service. We were strictly adhering to the 10 person limit at that time. I was so discouraged. I feared that the brightest days of our church were over. Our pastor told stories about faith and miracles from when the church had first started, but I started to believe that those days were behind us, that 10 people in a room and a live stream service were our new normal. The Lord continued to stir my heart in that prayer time that morning. Luke, begin visualizing the future, he whispered to me. I stopped and looked around the room. I was praying in our church sanctuary, which would fit around 800 people. I didn't have a vision for the future. I mean, an hour earlier, my hair was falling out in the shower due to stress and anxiety. I sat down at the stage and just stared out into the empty auditorium. Slowly, in my mind's eye, I started to see it. I imagined a full sanctuary filled with people worshiping and pursuing God. I saw graphics where we were announcing three services because each service was so packed we couldn't fit them in one experience. I saw three services with 800 people each, our church going from 10 to 2,400 people. I saw services with wheelchair-bound people coming in and leaving healed. I saw people talking in the restaurants across the street. They don't have all their stuff together at that church, but something happens when people gather there. I began to tap into God's vision for our future. The hamster on the wheel in my mind started running faster. President Trump had just announced Space Force. You remember that? I dreamed of putting the first Christian missionary in space. If Trump could open a branch of the military to explore the universe, why couldn't we plant churches in space? I took what was a burden of the current situation and channeled God's imagination to visualize a bigger dream. Why don't you try it? It's not about chasing off bad thoughts. It's about embracing and chasing God thoughts. Let your sight get set in in your spiritual bow. Zoom in on what God sees regarding your finances, your business, your ministry, your school, your family. Establish new thoughts. Write down your vision. Even if you don't know all the details, write down what you know. Tune out the world and just freaking dream. If you're finding it hard to tap into God's vision for your life, it may be that you don't trust him as the script writer of your life. Maybe you're still trying to write, direct, and act. If so, surrender to God and allow his will to supersede yours. If you need help doing this or understanding this, please reach out to me or a local pastor near you. I pray that this book has challenged your heart and given you hope to find your way out of the woods. If you need to talk more or want more help, please reach out to a trusted friend, adult, or me. I'm at Luke Gajari on all the socials. I'll link to my website where you can contact me as well. Listen, the woods are dark and scary, and it's easy to feel lost and alone. Help is available. You're not alone. There's a road just through the trees you're stuck in. Believe with me that life won't always be this way, and that freedom and joy can be yours. Thanks for tuning in, watching, whatever. Again, the suicide hotline, number 988. If you're struggling right now, you need help in this very moment. Um, it's available 24 hours, English, Spanish, number 988. Thanks again for watching. Just want to close by some acknowledgments. I wrote these in the book. I'll read them to you here. To my wife, Maritza, thanks for being so patient and enduring with my endless projects and passions. I love you. Uh, to Bella, Caleb, and Charlotte, I pray for a strong spirit in you and the nearness of the presence of God. My books are part of my legacy to you, but you are the ultimate legacy. I love each of you. To Chuck Farina, thank you for giving me your microphone and trusting me to lead the young people of your church. I've never met a pastor who prays more than you, and it makes a difference. And also, sorry for setting off the smoke alarm with the haze machine that one night and flipping the van trailer. To the young people of New Hope Church, this season of spirit-led ministry birthed 
this entire book. Thank you for being the best group of students to pastor and for allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us into some crazy moments. I miss you guys. That's it. Thanks again for watching, listening, reading. And uh, if you need any help or need someone to talk to, let me know.